Okay, great. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, so obviously, you know, this session is a workshop. We did a quick introduction yesterday. Uh, we did a keynote kind of a stuff. It was a bit rushed. We were tight on time. Uh, we'll essentially be covering similar stuff here, but we'll be going into much more details. We'll actually be doing a code walkthrough, going through the code, seeing how it is set up and stuff like that. Right? Any questions, more than welcome. Please interact, jump in, ask questions, and we'll see what is the best fitment that we can do. Uh, quick agenda. We'll go through a bunch of stuff. Uh, again, we have an agenda, but if you guys have questions slightly outside of it, given the time constraints, we'll be more than happy to discuss those as well. Right? Okay, quick thing that we discussed yesterday, lighting up of your Android apps, right? So you come back and build an Android app, you come back and build a Java applet, you come back and build a game, you come back and build a traffic monitoring app, whatever it is, uh, you think of a great business scenario, but to enable this, you need a whole bunch of backend services, right? So one of the first things that you do is you come back and start consuming a bunch of backend services. We are talking in this case about Azure. Azure Sometimes there's a perception that it's a Microsoft technology. We have to use Microsoft platforms of Microsoft programming languages to code and stuff, which is not necessarily true. Okay? You can come back and continue to use the languages that you're comfortable with. You can come back and you continue to use the platforms that you're comfortable with in most instances. Okay? So as an example, backend services, you can come back and build the entire backend services using a node.js. We give you a mobile services, which is a service out of the box, but you can also come back and set up a complete website using node.js, doing the entire configuration in node.js and take your entire code that you had today and migrate it onto the Azure platform as well. Right? So you can come back and continue to harvest backend services using either .NET or a node.js kind of a platform. Once you have this kind of a backend, you can choose to talk to different kind of a data stores. One of the first challenge that happens is we want to come back and work with data. Right? I want to have a to-do list, I have a corporate app, I have some other stuff, I want to store data, I want to pull in data. Data, you have a choice. We do give SQL Server, obviously. You do have choices of Oracle or virtual machine kind of a stuff. You do have the option, and I'll talk quickly about that, wherein you can choose not to use a relational database at all. Right? You can come back and say, I just have a JSON object, I want to store it in a blob or a table kind of a format, but I want it to be understandable, I want it to be queryable. Right? So you can come back and choose multiple different kinds of storage, implement it instantly, and quickly get started with it. You can also come back and use a whole bunch of big data kind of a scenarios, no SQL kind of a scenarios, wherein you can use something called HD Insight, which is a Hadoop kind of an instance, or something like MongoDB to come back and say, I will use my node services to talk to those kind of a data storage and harvest them. The moment you have got plugins into those kind of a data storage, you pretty much have the entire span. Whatever you can connect to, any kind of a data storage that you can connect to is something that you can come back and start working with. And remember your front end is still, we are looking at it as a mobile device in terms of what you want to target. You get a whole bunch of additional services so the challenge is putting up your first app, talking to a data, talking to a database, doing a CRUD operation is relatively easy. Right? After that, you start facing a bunch of challenges. Right? Authentication is one of them. We do want to some kind of an OAuth authentication. We want to come back and say, you know, Facebook authentication, Twitter authentication, Google authentication, Microsoft Live ID authentication, etc. In many instances, you also want to take your app and target it to corporate users who already have their own setup, Active Directory setup, etc. And you want to come back and say, I want that authentication as well, so that I can come back and cross-sell it to my corporate customers. Right? So touching up on services like authentication, like notifications, etc., is something that you have to end up writing a lot, wherein Azure comes back and gives you a whole bunch of these services out of the box. Quick note here. We will be talking of some of these services, but these services are pretty vast, right? There's a whole bunch of these services and Microsoft keeps adding on newer services on a regular basis. Okay? Media services is one of them. Uh, it seems, you know, for people who are not very familiar with it, it seems not too big a challenge. But as you get into it, multiple encoding, live streaming of the video, coming back and having multiple different bit rates, targeting multiple devices in terms of how you want to deliver it, whole bunch of server-side challenges, right? And all of these become services that are given for you, right? So in many instances, the benefit more than the initial structure that I talked about, which is, you know, having a service, talking to data kind of a stuff, that you pretty much can do anywhere. It's a quick starter on Azure. But the moment you start seeing a whole bunch of other services, that's when you realize that 
you know, that is something that will help us a lot. Most people end up benefiting from one of these services and it's one of these services that pull them in. Somebody needs a media service, which is what pulls them into Azure. Somebody needs push notification services, that's what pulls them into Azure, right? So a whole bunch of these services is typically what gives you a lot of value add when you want to come back and look at adding onto this platform. As part of all of this, one of the things that you can also do is you can come back and connect to the whole Microsoft stack, Office 365, you know, OneNote, Skype, Yammer, etc. Again, typically in use for corporate customers, right? So we had this uh, customer who, were, who was building a project management kind of an app, completely non-Microsoft technologies, the entire company had never worked on Microsoft technologies, but they had this Android app, they had this you know, JavaScript web-based app for project management, and they had their entire set of services, agile project management kind of stuff. But when they interacted with customers, the customer came back and said, I have all my project data already in my enterprise ERB store, right? I have all my users already in Active Directory. I don't want to sit and replicate all of that, right? I already have a bunch of documents in SharePoint. So while I love your app, I would want it to come back and integrate with other pieces in my enterprise, right? So if you want to come back and integrate with other pieces in the enterprise, that is also something that Azure makes it quite easy and simple for you. Along with mobile services, like I told you, we have notification services. Sorry, we have notification services. We'll talk about that. That's one of the big pushes. Uh, gives a lot of value add and works with multiple different providers. So you can deliver notifications to the Windows platform, to the iOS platform, to the Android platform, etc., all from one single hub. And that's a very largely scalable hub for you to come back and work with a notification kind of scenario. Now, when we are talking of the cloud, there are three aspects to the cloud. Right? And if you're familiar with cloud, I can probably skip this, but I'll give you a quick introduction. If anybody has questions, we can go a little bit more deeper into it. Microsoft started off in terms of offering SaaS services. This is what everyone does. A Gmail, a Hotmail, a Outlook.com, etc., are all SaaS services. Right? Microsoft nearly four to five years ago introduced a whole bunch of PaaS services, which is what Azure was. Right? So Azure came back and said, you know, you've got a website, you've got a SQL database, you've got a notification services, you've got a mobile services. Initially, that is something that didn't pick up too much, right? Because people were already used to working in a certain way. Today, you had a Linux box. Today, you had a Windows box. You were developing a whole bunch of applications on that. Moving became a pain. What happened was Microsoft also came back and introduced IAS. IAS is infrastructure as a service. When you come to infrastructure as a service, you essentially get a box in the cloud. The box can be Windows. The box can be Linux. The box can be any operating system that you want, which is supported. You can choose your own customized version of an operating system. You have Oracle boxes online, so you pretty much can come back and set up any kind of a box that you want. Okay? So if we quickly look at uh, Azure infrastructure, when you log on to Azure, you get the whole dashboard. As part of the dashboard, you have a bunch of services that you can come back and work with. Right? And one of these is what we call as a virtual machine. Okay. So I come back and see new compute, still loading. Right. Virtual machine from gallery. So if you look at it, we have Ubuntu, we have CoreOS, we have CentOS, we have SUSE, we have Oracle, we have Puppet Labs. So when you come back and take a look at it, the infrastructure is not limited to the Microsoft platform at all. It's a box in the cloud, right? And you can pretty much come back and implement any box in the cloud. So most people came back and said, I'm familiar with a certain way of working. I will come back and move my box in the cloud and I'll get a lot of scalability benefits, right? And that was one of the first movements. That was, that's what got us critical mass, right? In fact, that's true. Most other places, when you go to Amazon, you get a box in the cloud. When you go somewhere else, you get a box in the cloud, right? But you also need to understand that when you're talking of a IAS infrastructure, you get a bunch of cloud features, but you still are looking at the OS the way it was, putting it up there. You still have a lot of work to do. Right? A step behind or a step better than the whole IAS services is what we call as PaaS services. So in PaaS services, what we do is we come back and give you a bunch of features. So we give you a SQL database in the cloud. We give you storage in the cloud. We give you media services in the cloud. 
you don't necessarily get a OS, you don't do a RDP, you don't connect to it, you don't work off it, but internally behind the scenes, it's still a virtual machine, a virtual machine which gives you one service and that service is extremely fine tuned to deliver what it promises. Right? That's the whole concept in terms of benefits of using something of a pass services. Other advantage of a pass service, pass service is always upgraded from the back end, it's always on the latest version, compatibility is maintained, rarely anything breaks. So it sort of evolves and you get to evolve with it as you go ahead. And also from a cost perspective, it is dramatically cheaper than the IAS services, right? typically one tenth kind of a stuff. Right? So thought process, we are primarily looking at a whole bunch of pass services that we can come back and work with. Microsoft offers a bunch of past services, right? So you can come back and say, I want to work with websites, I want to work with mobile services. Like I told you, all of these are things that you can use cross-platform. So even when we say websites, you can have a node.js uh, implementation, implement a website with that, open it up as a service, restful service, and consume from your apps, right? Okay. Across all of these, you have the option in terms of getting a scalable platform at the back end, right? So you can come and choose that I want to start with the free stuff, I want to move up to a basic environment, I want to move up to a standard environment, I want to downgrade it. You have choices of adding on more compute power, you have uh, choices of scaling it out to multiple geographies. So all the benefits in terms of moving, you know, onto the cloud is something that you get automatically configured for all of these past services as well, right? Uh, something that you should look at, uh, and that's pretty much available across most of the cloud providers. So that's typically the reason in terms of why you would move to the cloud. Quick questions and comments. Has anyone uh, looked in terms of moving to the cloud? Any experience with Azure? Any quick questions around Azure per se? Anybody tried Azure? Anybody tried any other cloud services? Amazon, Google? Which ones? Amazon, right? So you're comfortable with Amazon. So you get similar kind of features wherein you can come back and scale and stuff. Obviously, there are minor differences which you can come back and harvest, right? But using a service in the cloud is something that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of what you want to do, right? Uh, that's primarily the objective there. Okay. Let's take it forward in terms of specifically how do you build for Android, okay? High level, there are three ways you can come back and use your, uh, you can continue to use your platform, which is a native way of developing, using your Java kind of a stuff, Eclipse plugin, come back, develop in Eclipse, uh, publish it to your Android app kind of a stuff. You have the option of a hybrid using something called PhoneGap, wherein you can build your user interface with HTML5, but you can come back and say, I want to now port it onto a mobile application. Right? Advantage with things like PhoneGap is the fact that you can come back and say, you know, I will port it to iOS, I will port it to Android, etc., etc. Right? A third option is Xamarin, right? Uh, it's no longer called Mono, it's Xamarin. So basically you can come back and use something like C Sharp to again come back and say, I will use C Sharp as a development environment and port it to one of these different kind of a platforms, right? Quick set of development tools. You have multiple choices, we'll talk more about this later. So you do have multiple choices from a development platform kind of a perspective. Now let's take a quick look in terms of using Eclipse, how do I go about building a app on Azure? I attempted this yesterday and I got some errors, so I'll attempt it again today. I'll start off in terms of saying I want to build a new mobile service. Droidcon BLR. Okay. I will create a new SQL database. Say East US. Database server. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm coming back and creating a mobile service which is a front end for the mobile app and I'm creating a database at the back end for that. 
Uh, the moment I do this wizard based configuration, it creates a front end for me, creates a back end for me, connects both of these in terms of connection string, security, passwords, etc., and gives me a up and running site which I can come back and consume for my mobile services. How are primarily mobile services different from websites? A very subtle difference, websites has a user interface, HTML page, etc. It's configured for people to come back and visit your website. Mobile services are primarily backend services. They open up a restful interface, wherein you come back and say you consume these services, but by default there is no direct user interface hosted out of that, right? Subtle kind of a difference, but essentially that's at a high level what it does. Most operations as part of Azure happens as part of a background async process. So you can come back and configure multiple stuff. You can start servers, you can start other operations, and it goes on and it tells you what are the status once it is done. So it'll take a minute or so to configure it. Like I was quickly mentioning yesterday, once it does that, what it does is it gives you a quick starter kit wherein you can come back and say pick the mobile service, come back and say create a default table and say give me a Eclipse project for it. So that I know the entire shell structure for me to come back and quickly get started. Right? So that's something that it sets up in the background. Once it sets up the basic structure, you have an app, you have the service at the back end, and you have all the pieces for you to get started, right? Uh, then it's a matter of coming back and adding more tables, adding more definitions in terms of storage, and get scaling it out. You do have an option wherein you can configure it for dynamic table columns, wherein you come back and say, as a JSON, if I send you six more columns, create those columns and store it in, right? So I don't have to do a table design upfront. Right? It's something that's commonly in use, uh, especially if you're using a ORM kind of a tool, especially if you're using a, you know, a dynamic kind of a storage, it allows you to come back and you know, add columns on the fly as and when you want to come back and store it. Give it a minute. Successfully created. So I will take this, I will say that I want to target Android. You do have starter kits for others as well, so you can come back and choose what is the kind of starter kit that you want. I will come back and create a default table for me to get started. And I will download a app. Stop my session demos. Try to call. Right. So I just wanted you guys to get a perspective in terms of saying if you want to get started, how do you go about doing that? Now I will go to my Eclipse, I will come back and import an existing Android project, I will add this in, okay. So it gives me a startup project, if you open up the source you get three things, to do activity, to do item, to do adapter. To do item and to do adapter are just wrappers. Uh, if you go to the to do activity, that's where the logic is in terms of all the method calling. And one of the things it has, which is pre-configured for you, is the URL that you're using and a key, okay? So if you were doing this manually, what you would have done is you would have got the URL from the application, right? So it comes back and tells you what is the URL that you want to work with and you would have gone to manage keys and taken up the application key, right, and configured it there. So these are two entry points that you need for your app to come back and connect. And when you use the sample site, that sort of automatically gets configured for you. So, you know, you know, just add those keys in there and get started with it. So I will do my attempt 
at deploying this. Right? So it deploys to an emulator and I can come back and say, now I have the emulator, I now you know, should get all the pieces, I can come back and start working with it. Quick note here, right? The moment we come back and set up an application, one of the first things that we are challenged with is to come back and use some kind of a data services the backend. Right? How many of you work with different kinds of data stores? What are the kind of data stores that you work with? Relational, non-relational, what kind of non-relational? MongoDB, right? Hmm? MongoDB primarily. Any other, other than MongoDB? Anybody who works with files a lot, media files, files, objects, blobs, storage kind of a stuff. Not much? Okay. So you have both the choices, you know, relational is one option. In most instances, relational is not necessarily the best option. Uh, MongoDB is a classic example in terms of people coming back and saying that, you know, we want a NoSQL kind of a database and we want to come back and store data as part of it. Especially if you have got things like a survey with a whole bunch of tags, right? A dynamic kind of a data, things which are very flexible. It makes a lot of sense to use a NoSQL kind of a database, right? First item. One of the things that Azure also gives you is it gives you what is called as a table storage, right? A table storage is an inbuilt structure when you come back and say, I want to create a table. Uh, Treat it like a flat file, but it's a structured flat file, right? So I send a JSON object, it stores the entire JSON as it is and makes it queryable for you, right? So you can also come back and that's a very lightweight kind of a stuff. That's something that you can use. And you can also use Azure storage for a lot of heavyweight objects like files, documents, media files. I want to have database backups, right? Wherein each of them is 150 gig, right? Each of them is one gig kind of a stuff. But I want to organize all of them. I want to tag all of them. I want to query all of them. I want to search through all of my backups that are there. So you can go all the way from small files up to extremely large files as part of working with the storage, right? And across working with all of these file systems kind of a stuff, you can also come back and use relational database and you can use MongoDB, right? No SQL kind of a environments as well. Now, I came back and added item here. If I go back to my app, my mobile services app, right? this is the DroidCon. I have a data section. I have a to-do list item. Right? You will notice that that data is visible to me here. Right? This is where I come back and do all my work with data. Now, this data is very open right now. I can come back and configure my columns. I can come back and work with permissions. I can work with scripts. The scripts are the equivalent of backend triggers. It's not necessarily a trigger, but it's more like saying, if I save some data behind the scenes, come back and do something with it, right? And we'll see an example of that when we want to do notifications, when we want to do some other operations, we'll come back and take a look at that, right? So you have a structure wherein you have an app. You have the app talking through a RESTful kind of an interface. You are getting the app to come back and push data. It stores data in a structured format. As part of this data, you can work with permissions. You can work with a backend logic. In most instances, you will use this when the logic is very simplistic, right? Not very complicated kind of a stuff. You can come back and use something like this and get started with the whole set of services. Okay. Any questions, any comments so far? Fair enough. Right. Now, let's come back and start enhancing this, right? Let's come back and say, as an example, I want to add authentication services, right? I want to come back and say, I want your app to use a Google authentication and I want people to log on with a Google authentication and then use my app, right? So I want to add on authentication services. Authentication services works in two levels. First, I log on to my Google account, right? I go to accounts.google.com, I log on. I come to my Google Cloud console, when I come back to cloud.google.com, and here I start creating a bunch of projects. I create an API project, and for the API project, I define my authentication. Right? I define what is my OAuth. So I create a new client, 
I come back and say, what are the type of client, where am I going to access it from, etc. And once I create a client, in my case, I've already created a client, I've come back and said, this is where I'm going to access it from, this is the redirect login, and I have a client secret. So I have a client ID and a client secret, right? So when we work with authentication, we configure this on the Google side, right? And come back and say, this is a trusted app. So even though you're using an Android app, we are coming back and saying, as part of the Android app, I talk to my server, which is hosted in Azure as part of mobile services, but because it needs authentication, please redirect me to the Google stuff. It'll pop up its own authentication dialog box. I will authenticate myself. It'll get a key back and I will continue, which essentially means you're not storing user IDs in your system. You're not storing passwords in your system. You're not doing any of that in your system, right? So you can set up something like that. Once we do this, I will go back here, take the example of the authentication stuff. For me to ensure that my system needs authentication, I will go to data, I will go to permissions, by default, the permissions is configured to come back and say anybody with a valid app, anybody with a my key, the key that I showed you before, come back and allow them to do what they want, right? But if I want to enhance that, I can come back and say only authenticated users will have insert, update, delete permissions, right? So now what the system does is it says that for you to work with any of these features, I need you to be authenticated. How it's to be authenticated, you tell me what is your choice, but user IDs and passwords are maintained in that authentication system, and I will use that to come back and log on and continue my operations here. Come back here to do this. Authentication. Right. Now, for us to know that our backend system uses what kind of an authentication, we have a section called identity. So when I go to identity, Azure gives me an option to come back and say Microsoft account settings, Facebook settings, Twitter settings, Google settings, right? So remember I told you about when you log on to Google and create a client authentication, you create a client project, API project. It gives you a client key and a client secret, right? You come back and enter those here. You enter the client ID here and the client secret here, right? That's how Google authentication knows that this is a system from this URL will come back and make a request to me and I have to honor that request. The, lo the logic is pretty much the same in everything. So whether you're using Facebook authentication, Twitter authentication, etc., you go there and come back and define an app. It gives a client ID and a client uh, secret. You come back and configure the equivalent of that here and that's how the two systems trust each other, okay? But like I mentioned before, what you can also do is you can come back and extend this to Active Directory and Microsoft accounts as well. Microsoft account is the live account, Windows Azure Active Directory is the corporate Active Directory. There are two levels from Active Directory perspective, right? You, if you're looking at a company which does not have Active Directory infrastructure today, but would like to use it, as part of Azure, you've got Active Directory services. Turn it on, create a bunch of authentication, create a bunch of users, you can get started with it. It's a session all by itself, gives you a whole bunch of permissions, uh, gives you a whole bunch of features, and you can choose whether you want to use it or not. Right? Second, and which is the kickstarter for most people, is I've got an enterprise which is already using Active Directory. Right? In which case, I want to come back and integrate with that. So one of the things that Microsoft has done is all the newer versions of Windows as part of Active Directory already support OAuth. So you go to your enterprise existing installation of Active Directory, come back and right click and say I want to enable it for OAuth, you get a similar API URL and a client ID and allowing of multiple tenants. So you come back, take that client ID, configure it here, now what will happen is the moment you come back and hit your cloud service, it goes back against your enterprise Active Directory, authenticates you and then comes back and takes you forward as part of working with the application. When I go to my to-do application, and I set it up for authentication, I 
I define here what is the authentication provider to be used, right? Typically what you'll end up doing is you'll put multiple buttons. You come back and say sign in with Google, sign in with Facebook, sign in with uh, Twitter, etc. Sign in with Google, you'll come back and say use Google as a provider, sign in with Facebook, you'll use Facebook as a provider, so on and so forth, right? So you use each one of these to come back and work with that. Quickly do this again. did set up the authentication in the backend, right? So if I've done all my configurations right, what it should do is it should pop up a dialog for me in terms of saying, you know, use your Google credentials and based on that login and then take the whole thing forward. Okay. I'll have to check why it's not popping up, right? Uh, I think I registered this uh, device with my Google ID. Right? So, which is why it probably comes back and says, you know, it's already registered and so it's taking it forward, right? I'll quickly change the configuration, check it out. But logically, this is where you come back and start adding on authentication kind of a definitions. Now, let's take a look at one extension to this. One of the common scenarios that people come back and look at is push notifications, right? Uh, Multiple examples of push notifications, I want to come back and notify users. It could be as simple as an information that I want to give, saying there's a new version of the app, something has changed kind of a stuff. It could get as complex in terms of saying that, you know, there is some event right now and I want to notify you right now, right? Notifications can be as uh, effective as your flight has got delayed now, right? You had a flight in the next half an hour, it's got delayed, there is an information that I want to push to you. Right? Uh, there are other examples, for example, uh, there is an IPL match, it's either got delayed or cancelled or changed and I want to notify all the people who have got tickets immediately at this point in time. Right? One of the challenges in a push notification kind of a scenario is the fact that we want to send out a blast push notification to multiple different vendors. Right? Typically, when you come back and do something like this, how would you do it? Anybody implemented notifications as part of their apps? Okay. So how do you logically do something like that? Can't hear you. Okay. All right. Correct. But how do you trigger the notifications? Mm -hmm. Correct. So you use some kind of a local script to come back and say, you know, I will, as part of my logic, I will pull it up, push it to C2DM, and then it will push the notifications. One of the challenges that we have is. The moment you run a local script, the moment you run your own logic, right, it takes a while for it to run. So if you take an example of saying, I want to send out a notification to 10 lakh people now, right, just for your script to look at your data in a loop, come back and push it out to the notification engine itself takes a lot of time. Notification engines are already in the cloud, they scale, right, so that platform is already there. But the source entry point for us to come back and create this notification itself takes time. Right? So there are examples wherein, you know, by the time we start sending notifications 1.5 lakh people, by the time we finish, that sending process itself takes over 4 to 6 hours. In which case, the whole notification becomes useless and void. Right? What Azure does as part of the whole notification engine is it uses the concept of a notification hub. Right? So the moment you come back and say, as part of my mobile services, I want to do a push notification. In the background, it sets up a notification hub. A notification hub is a server-based, queue-based platform. It's a service bus based, based platform, where in the moment you come back and say send notification, asynchronously it accepts it, right? And it decides how to scale out and how to send, right? Which means I can actually take a lakh and a half, you know, notifications that I want to send, send it to Azure in terms of saying this is the notification I want to send, it will accept all of that within a few seconds. Right? It now raises multiple events to come back and target what are the different notification hub I want to connect to and how to actually deliver all of these notifications. Right? So depending on a performance kind of a stuff, you can actually in around you know a few minutes or so deliver lakhs of notifications across multiple user bases. Right? How do you go about setting it up? On the Google side, you come back and define a public API access method. So you define your API key and how you want to connect to it. 
on the mobile services, you come back as part of the push definition, you configure saying, I will use the Google Cloud messaging services, right? So I will use the GCM infrastructure for me to come back and define the key here, right? And remember the script I was telling you about? So you then go back to the script as part of your data. Right? And as part of the script, you define saying that whenever I get an input message or whenever I get some kind of a logic based on which I want to trigger, I will now come back and here do a push.gcm.send wherein because I know the GCM key, I will come back and configure this and send it out. You have multiple options as part of the whole notification hub. You are not limited to just using the GCM platform. You can choose to use the Apple platform. You can choose to use the Microsoft platform. So you can choose to come back and say, I will deliver my push across multiple different platform notifications all as a hub. Right? In fact, one of the scenarios, you could continue using your existing backend for your mobile service and you could integrate that with just the notification hub. So you don't need to move your entire mobile backend to Azure. You can come back and say, I already have my setup, I already have my data center, I already have the entire thing hosted, but for me to scale up on my notification instances, I will just take that piece, connect it onto the notification services, and come back and say, I want to notify a few million users at a point in time, right? That's how you come back and you can connect to it. So you can configure Apple push notification, you can configure Windows phone notification, so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, when you are dependent on uh, services like Google uh, Cloud Messaging or CPM, CPM deprecated overnight. Right. And changing to GCM. Right. And the whole code, whatever is written, has to be changed. Mm -hmm. So, in a funny way, while that's not a direct benefit that we offer, in a funny way, that's a value that you get, uh, in the sense that because you're using this restful service, if Google decides to change its notification services to the back end, Microsoft will come back and update Azure for the new set of services. You, as long as you're talking to the notification hub, are still abstracted from that. Right? So, in that sense, that makes it slightly easier. Right? Uh, but that would be true of any other service provider which connects to GCM or connects to services. Right? What's the scalable model here? So one of the things, you know, I'll quickly show you the notifications hub. The notifications hub is technically independent of your mobile services. Right? So if you go to the notification hub, you can use the notification hub as an independent service which got nothing to do with anything else. The notification hub is event based, right? So rather than, you know, coming back in a loop and saying, you know, for each send kind of a stuff, you can come back and say, I have these, you know, so many records, I want to push it up there and asynchronously now you raise events. So if I send 10,000 records to it, it'll accept 10,000 records and internally it'll raise 10,000 events saying these notifications are now to be delivered. And because it's a cloud-based service, it scales to handle all of these 10,000 events and triggers off what is the kind of notifications to be sent. Okay, so two different things, right? In the example that I gave, the bottleneck was sending, right? The moment I come back and say, I want to send one by one, and that is true whether I connect to a GCM or whether I connect to a Windows notification platform. Even if I connect to a Windows notification platform and I say one by one send out these notifications, it's going to take me a while just to send out the notification, right? The concept of the notification hub is the fact that it scales, right? Now the problem that it solves is not just the scalability factor. There are two other things. One, you want to deliver to multiple different notifications. Right? Second is you want to target notifications, right? So a simple example is I sent a notification to you. I don't know whether you have read it or not. I do know that you've got multiple platforms, right? Now I can come back and say, if I don't, if I know you haven't read a notification in say 15 minutes, send a notification to another platform, right? So the logic and the value behind it in terms of targeted notification is the value that it provides along with scalability, right? So that's the problem that it's trying to solve. Mm-hmm. That will have to be done by you. There'll be some trigger point, right? So as an example, you can set up a job which does that. Uh, 
anyone on the system to log in. We can use uh, all the live updated stuff. We can update it in the pub. So this thing is called a hub network. The car is uh, built specifically to one thing and the car. Right? So not only doing that, you are actually you are not taking it to the port, the app port. The app port still keeps updating your back end. The back end updates the hub. Right. So you can think of it in three ways. There are three problems from the notification perspective that it solves. One is performance from a sending perspective, a rules engine and a delivery. Right. Performance from a sending perspective, you still need to do the work of saying pick data and send to the notification hub. Right. But because notification hub is event based and asynchronous, it can receive millions of records pretty much instantaneously. Right. Second, like he mentioned, you take this run through a rules engine wherein you come back and say, do I want to target in French? Has somebody come back and said, send me notifications only in the morning? Has somebody come back and said, don't disturb me at this point in time? Ha do we want to do something like a multiple retries? So you have a rules engine based on which you can come back and configure what is the kind of notification that you want to target. And third is delivering across multiple different platforms. Right. So that sort of becomes the engine in terms of what the notification hub gives you from a benefit perspective. Thank you. 
You also have that small benefit in terms of saying if the delivery platform changes some definition as part of the notification hub, that's something that we do as part of the infrastructure because it's a pass service, right? So you're safeguarded from that perspective as well. Somebody else had a question. Yeah. No, no. So. Right. So when I talk to online, people are can be used, otherwise you can use the platform Right. So like you mentioned, it's extensible. So if you want to come back and say, I want to do web-based notification, you can come back and implement a signal R, sent to that, and signal R can come back and notify you on the web. Right? Uh, so it's an extensible platform, you can add on multiple extensions to it. Right? Abhishek, you want to come up and set up your machine? So Quick summary, I had a bunch of slides around the whole stuff, but essentially you have the option in terms of coming back and saying that there's a bunch of services that you can use, and as part of all of these services, you can leverage you know, the Azure backend services. All the benefits of scale, all the benefits of performance, all of that is something that you can get. One last thing I wanted to mention while he's setting it up is Azure also gives you a complete environment for managing your development. So as an example, you can come back and say, I have uh, I have maintained all my source in GitHub, right? Uh, or in some other Git repository. Azure gives you the benefit of coming back and saying, I will do a regular continuous integration deployment from Git direct to Azure, right? So it also has a whole bunch of development tool support wherein you can come back and say, no, I have a backend system. I come back and maintain all of that repository in Git. I go through a continuous integration in the cloud. I go through a continuous deployment to the cloud. I deploy it here. I can get multiple staging environments. So I can get like environment one, two, three, four, wherein I say environment one is a test environment, right? Wherein it'll get deployed, but it's not yet hitting production, right? Environment two is an upgrade to that, wherein I come back and say, okay, for some of my users, it's been upgraded, and that's the environment that they use, right? So I can set up multiple environments, and I can set up the equivalent of a continuous integration or a continuous deployment kind of a process, direct from something like Git, Bitbucket, etc., onto the Azure platform. Okay. So along with all the services that you get in terms of you know features that you want to leverage in your application, development and release kind of a process in the background is also something that you get which is integrated into the same account. Okay. This is one of the things I wanted to mention if you are using your own IIS platform, you're using your own box, there's a lot of grunt work that you still have to do. Right? You have to configure for deployment, you have to configure multiple environments, you use a chef puppet kind of a stuff to create multiple environments, uh, you have to decide when to move it from which environment to which environment. So Azure sort of gives you all of those things in the background in terms of maintaining it as well. You get a dashboard, you get to log, view all the logs, you get to view all the performance, it gives you a graph in terms of number of hits, what is the performance that is happening, CPU utilization, memory utilization, what is the response time. You can put up rules which says if it goes beyond a certain point of time, alert me. You can write PowerShell scripts to come back and see if it goes certain beyond a certain point of time, add one more load balancing setup to it, right? So a lot of development administration kind of a feature is also integrated into it, right? Which is what in nowadays we call as DevOps. So the whole DevOps piece is also something that's integrated as part of the cloud platform, right? So uh, where the pricing policy is, 
We do for each service wise also, right? So you have an option wherein you come back and start light. For example, 10 mobile services and 10 websites and one small database is something that you can get free of cost, right? Now beyond that, depending on services that you use, you can come back and touch it up. Again, all the pricing is on a per minute kind of a stuff. So you can come back and choose to say, I want to use notifications and I want to use a bunch of them for the next one month. Then I want to downgrade it and not use it beyond that, right? So you can choose to do things like that as well. Right? Uh, it is dynamic. It becomes slightly difficult to do a direct kind of a comparison. It's like our Airtel bills, right? Uh, all of us get the bill, we pay, right? None of us really know what we got billed for, right? Uh, an example I was giving, you know, if there's a discount post 10 o'clock and you made the call at 9.45 and talked till 10.30, you really don't know what bill you got, right? Uh, so it's a sort of, comp uh, you know, uh, problematic from a comparison perspective, uh, but the moment you run it for one month on Azure and run it for one month somewhere else, you realize that because of the flexibility, the pricing actually works out better for you, right? Thank you. Thanks, Praveen. Uh, so, we have still some time left, so I'll quickly run you through some, some cool things. How many of you are interested in seeing some media stuff? Media? Media, 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 media. Okay. So, as, as we said, right, Azure is huge. And how many of you are app developers or indie app developers or consumer app developers? How many of you do that for enterprises? So it's a mixed one, right? So how many of you actually need media in your app or stream media in your app or plan to stream media in your app? Okay, right. So common issues which you would have faced, did you guys actually stream media? No, 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 no one, okay. Cool, so I'll quickly uh, set this up and show you how you can start in like 10 minutes. Uh, what would be your base? What, uh, I'll, I'll give you different options, how you can quickly start with media. Uh, how many of you are Java developers? All of you. Uh, PHP? C sharp? <coughs> okay. <laughs> okay, cool. So, <clears throat> I'll set this up with Java. Uh, so, we'll talk about Java and how you, you leverage this. Uh, one of th the simpler things is, uh, this is the portal which you would have probably got used to seeing now. There is an option called media services here. And uh, you can create media containers here, uh, and as many as you want. So if you want to create another media service namespace here, you can quickly set that up, quick create. You can select a particular region where you want this service to be hosted, based on probably you will keep it in vicinity of your users. Uh, and I can select Southeast Asia or uh, whichever. India is going to come up soon as well. Uh, storage account, because all these media content which you're putting on to the cloud needs to be stored somewhere, right? So what you would be using is, you will be using Azure storage for storing that content over there and you will be using uh, the media services which is like app service layer to actually create, because see media streaming is not just about giving a particular video output to a player and then player starts playing. Uh, you care about good experience to the user. When the user is traveling, his internet is fluctuating, uh, it should be adaptive in nature, the media stream and stuff, which means you need to have multi-bitrate video there, right? That's the common thing, especially in India where we are struggling with internet, especially on our mobile phones. It makes a lot of sense to have an infrastructure which can do multi-bit streaming, right? Now this sounds all complex, but let's look how simply that can be achieved. So you go ahead, you create a media service here, uh, you use a particular storage here, and then a subscription which you will have for Azure, right? That's all you do. I just did some time back uh, here, DroidCon, and uh, this is how it looks like. And once you come here, inside a particular media service uh, uh, entry which you have created, you will have all those tabs on, on the top. It does look confusing in, uh, in the you know, lots of things to actually digest. Uh, you have a dashboard, content protection, content, jobs, streaming inputs, channels, and encoding. So it's very simple. As a guy, you look into dashboard to understand who all 
how many people are streaming my video to see all the stats and stuff of because you will be charged for that right uh, you will be basically charged for the servers here like you have an encoding server which encodes it to multi-bit rate to the format you want. If you want to stream HLS, you can stream HLS. If you have an Android app or uh, iOS app which requires HLS stream to be there, you can do that. Uh, you can't do that on a Windows server, but we ensure through media services, we do give you HLS output as well. Uh, quickly to get started, now there are two ways. One, you upload the media content through this portal, which is a very naive way of doing it, but yeah, for trying it out stuff, you can do it, but you would want control over application like a back-end program which kind of ingests, ingests this particular video onto my storage and then it starts the encoding as well. So we have the APIs there. So if you're Java developers, just click on this Java tab and then this is what you need to copy and paste. So what here you get is a console app code. Uh, what you will need to install is the tools. Here are the tools, install the media SDK, services SDK for Java, and then copy and update this code snippet. Uh, this is basically from my configuration, so this automatically generates your, uh, based on, you know, I created a container called DroidCon, so you can see all those things with the particular access control URL, which Azure gives me, and all those details. So don't worry about it, just uh, whenever you create a particular container, just copy this piece of code and paste it in your code. So this is basically for uploading a video programmatically. You will have to point out, uh, you know, path to your video as well. So it's uh, assuming it's using this. So of course, replace this with your particular video, the path, and then just go ahead and run this. What this will do is it will create a particular, uh, with this particular path file, uh, it will upload that on Azure and put it there. So media service will have access to this file now. Then comes the second job, which is encoding the video. Now you have put maybe an MP4 video onto the cloud. The next job is I want that to be, make it adaptive so that that can be streamed seamlessly uh, on devices on 3G or 4G or when I'm traveling on a cab, I can still stream it if my internet connection or the bandwidth goes low, uh, it starts streaming the low uh, uh, streams and I, I mean the quality goes bad, but the video still continues without buffering, right? That's the idea of um, adaptive streaming. So now, uh, second thing is, these are basically three presets which give you here so that, you know, uh, you can do your own set settings as well. This is the three presets which we are offering through your code, as in the sample code here. So you can select either HTML5, uh, a stream which is supported across all native HTML5 players, or uh, if you want to target a particular Flash stream or Silverlight stream, as in you're using those players, then you can use this. If you want to do only for, specifically for iOS devices and PC and Mac, so these are some of those <coughs> streams which you can leverage, right? So the moment I select something else, it kind of updates uh, the stream endpoint preset here. This is what you can actually manipulate and play around with to get the preset of your choice. You can find the list of all the presets on the documentation side of media services. Now, once you're done with this encoding, uh, you are actually done. Uh, you just need to s set up your stream server where which will start streaming there. That also you can do programmatically here, right? So here it looks like, you can see the other tabs here, uh, the streaming endpoints, uh, the content which I uploaded, so you can actually do it all through the portal as well, if not programmatically, you can have access to this content, you have an upload button here, so I can actually click on this particular upload, uh, it, and I can target from my local folders, whichever file I have, I can just go ahead and select that, starts uploading, so that's how simple is it. Uh, and also, if I have put manually, like, Imagine I'm running my whole workload on uh, on Azure. So now, like imagine if it's a CMS website, right? And I also give an option of creating a video stuff over there. And I'm storing that video on Azure storage. So it makes a lot of sense to programmatically pull it up from your Azure storage rather than actually downloading it and then uploading it through another service. So you can use Azure storage as well, even programmatically while uploading this video. Okay, so now um, you see it shows you, I, have, I had already created three encoded formats. This was my input, so you can actually see all the presets here, uh, the ones which you were seeing. These were common presets which were available in that code snippet. Uh, there are some advanced presets as well, uh, which you can look into, right? So there are, uh, it supports smooth streaming as well as adaptive uh, streaming for iOS devices. 
And the, the beauty of this idea is like if you are app developer targeting Android, iOS and Windows, generally you do have you know a common format across them. But if you want to give like also support Windows Phone 7 or a lower version of Android which probably didn't support HLS. Now those are the situations where you can use this, encode your video into multiple bit rates and from that client player as in the client app, you can target to that, um, get that stream, right? That's, that's the good thing here. And again, the common question which comes across is content pro protection, right? Uh, because I'm streaming over HTTP, anyone can actually get that stream uh, and then do whatever he wants out of that stream, right? Download the video out of it. So there is uh, two ways to protect your video using a common AES encryption. So we do that right from here. You can also upload AES encrypted video uh, and uh, there are frameworks across platforms. So we have a player frameworks, which ones, which is for Android, iOS, Windows, uh, and HTML5, which covers all across, right? So using that player framework, you can play these uh, encrypted videos, AES encrypted videos as well. So this, this kind of saves you, saves your stream from a third party accessing that stream, right? But now, if you want to further put conditions, like my video should be playable only thrice per user. Like I have a in-app purchase model and, I, and someone when he does an in-app purchase, he can watch my movies for like three times, not more than that, right? When I want to set like those advanced conditions, you will have to look into DRM. Right, uh, digital rights management, and uh, we also have a DRM, Play Ready DRM, available here uh, on the cloud. So you can use that. The licensing cost is a little higher, so don't want to talk about those. But if you want to develop your own, you can still use media services to cre create your own DRM here. But DRM is available if you want to secure your content and set conditions over there to, for access. So DRM kind of creates for each user, it creates a particular cer certificate, right? And based on that that has his access terms, uh, what kind of access does he have and blah blah. And then this is the jobs which you're doing, so when you're doing programmatically, you're running a lot of jobs, you're running a lot of encoding and stuff, you can uh, have a look at all over here. So th these are the tasks which I have done and these are finished, 100% encoding done, uh, just to keep a track of those things. And then there are two kinds of things, right? First, I encode using an encoding server, and then I have a streaming server, which is very, very, very important to stream my videos, right? So there is a there is a concept called dynamic packaging as well. For instance, you don't want to keep your data encoded. For instance, I have five different apps, uh, all of them using five different kinds of streams. But I don't know why should I keep the streams of all five apps on my storage? Doesn't make sense. It's eating up a lot of storage. So there's a concept called dynamic uh, packaging where you actually, based on a request coming from an older Android phone, which requires a particular scheme, uh, stream which is not understood by the new one, so the older format, uh, maybe it supports MP3 audio encryption, uh, I mean, uh, for, for audio it uses MP3 and uh, um, that is something used a little older, now people use AAC for audio. So imagine if you have run into such situations, right? You don't want to keep that whole stream converted, those GBOs of data converted into that format. Uh, you can use a dynamic packaging there, where when once a request comes in of, for a particular format, you start encoding that and give it. So it doesn't take time because encoding servers are huge here. So it will do in, in the real time. That helps you save cost on multiple storage. If you already have 100 GB of data uh, for your media, media, you don't want to have like uh, 500 GB of data, uh, all the same data in different formats. So that can help you save that uh, task. And then you have the streaming server. You can set up a new streaming server or endpoint and uh, you have a lot of things here in terms of scalability. That's the coolest part. Like it's it's a cloud service, so it better be scalable. Otherwise, why should I use that, right? So you can set up all those scalability conditions here. You can set up caching age. You can set up your CDN providers. If you use a CDN provider, maybe Akamai, you can set up their certificate and start using Akamai with uh, this particular set of media streams. And here's the capacity. So I can go up, 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 and so on. So you can see the streaming uh, units, uh, the bandwidth uh, which it increases. So it can give me a huge bandwidth, a dedicated bandwidth of like 2000 Mbps. So, so that my stream can easily afford to go through 2000 Mbps of requirement and still it just works fine. 
Uh, if you need a bandwidth beyond this, you will have to set up another endpoint and start using that, consuming that, right? So it's not a big deal because, but there's the max limit is 2000 Mbps. Beyond that, you will set up another endpoint, point to the same videos and to your app. So you can actually keep multipliers of this. So what I did is, um, I just hosted, how many of you know about Azure websites? Azure websites? Azure websites. That's that's one very simple thing. How many of you have your own blogs? Only one. Uh, you better create your own blogs, and I'll show you one very 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 cool thing uh, to do that. So here, if you go, of course you can use WordPress, but it's even cooler if it's hosted on your own uh, domain, and uh, if if you customize the version uh, rather than what web. Uh, WordPress gives you and then they charge you extra for that, right? So, <clears throat> as geeks, you would love to do, do such stuff. Uh, even though I hosted, what I did is, I hosted a HTML uh, with the same stream, which you see Bugs Bunny video here, uh, and I'm playing it through a website. So the website is kind of hitting back on the media services, pulling that media content and playing it here. So this is my website, let me just start with this. Uh, media streaming is running. I can quickly browse this and this is using a player framework to play this video and I have multiple options here. For instance, I can do something like an autoplay. So here's my HTML5 player. This works on Android device as well. Uh, you can actually try this URL, uh, mediastreaming.azurewebsites.net. I just hosted it some time back. So it, the player frame, framework gives me all, uh, all other option, options like accessibility, which means uh, it shows me a video here and this video is uh, supporting you know, different languages. So I can see it in English uh, or maybe in Spanish based on if my video has the support. So the player framework basically supports that. Right, so you guys can play around with this from your mobile device as well. Works uh, pretty well over there. Now, but since I talked about websites, it's a pretty cool thing, uh, especially for geeks, like to just quickly get started with. I don't want a Tomcat uh, or to set up a server behind or IIS behind and then start hosting stuff over there. Uh, so this is basically like a pass service. Uh, in fact, I'll say one level above pass service. So you don't even have to uh, do much of a code to get started here. If you just go into the websites and create a new one, So we, we give you a lot of different options in the gallery, which you can just select and start working on it, right? So we give you different CMS solutions, so you can see uh, how many of you are gonna go set blogs? Your own blogs, right? It's cool. So uh, if, you ha if you have a customer who is looking out for a hosting a particular solution, like which, which is mostly e-commerce based or CMS based, website is the ideal scenario because I'll say if you Say, if you consider infrastructure as service as real cloud or real scalability, it's not true. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if you have a virtual machine, uh, which has all your stuff, you can scale up and scale out, right? You can have multiple machines and then you have to take care of how do I manage my data concurrency and, and those things. So there are solutions to everything, right? But in a pure pass play, like websites, uh, you, you are not talking about that OS level at all. Uh, what you know is how many instances of your websites are on. And you can switch on, switch off based on certain conditions like the moment my CPU goes beyond 80% uh, start another instance of the website. So in, in cases which happens like if Flipkart for instance runs a particular promotion where they say on this day come on my website and buy it, uh, if they fail to give that probably they are not looking to pure play pass. Because if you were in a pure play pass, even then it can fail, but you have much lesser chances of fail because you, you can set up trigger conditions. Based on that, it automatically creates a new instance of your, uh, you know, a virtual machine, which you don't need to care about, uh, and deploy your same package, your app package, onto that machine, and it starts up, up and running, right? So it can happen, a dynamic scale is really available over there. So in this case, you can actually go ahead and select any one of these, uh, blogengine.net, uh, there is a WordPress as well. Uh, just go ahead, click on this, give it a URL, your name, one, two, three, should be available. Gosh. Okay, yeah, it's available, right? Uh, you can use 
uh, a new database for this or currently MySQL database, uh, the existing one is going to use. Select what particular web scale group do you want. You can set different web scale group. Again, costing differs here. So I have three subscriptions, which so it shows up here. So I can select either a basic. So here are thing in websites. You when you when you say free tier, it's like a particular instance of a web server that's been shared across multiple people. So you don't know about others' apps and stuff. But if you are critical about your security and if you want a dedicated machine where your app is hosted, you want to go for uh, basic or standard, right? So there's no guarantee on free whether it'll be hosted separately on a separate VM because it 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 will be shared. That's how probably it's free. Select your stuff uh, and just go back to the next WordPress database. Yes. Next. This is how simply you can set up your own blog here. And I did that uh, sometime back on websites. I was going through this solution. I just set up a Joomla there. How many of you use Joomla? No one? Okay, it's a CMS solution again. So I just set this up. Uh, you can actually browse this. This link is live. Test one to three Joomla. So all these crazy uh, domain names, uh, not domain names, these names like test one two three Joomla is kind of blocked by me by for all those demos and testing, right? So <clears throat> you guys have any questions till now? But it's it's like a quick start. So if you have your current application. Uh, in PHP, Python, you can just try and port this on, on this. The scalability is like pretty awesome. So scalability looks like this. You can set this conditions here. Uh, standard, you can see instance size which it's running on. Uh, it can go up to this. Now there's a beautiful thing called setup scheduled times. Generally, if your application is hosted in India and you know this is working hours of my company enterprise app 9 to 6, you can set up scaling stuff up stuff between 9 to 6. But again, you want to set another scaling stuff which is by metrics, right? So I can set up based on my CPU scale. Uh, if my instance count should range between 1 to 10 and uh, you know, I can say 2 to 10 and then my target CPU should be 60 to 80 percent. So this will be the main factor which will ensure how many VMs are up. So unless my, my, if my CPU falls below 60%, it'll close, start closing down instances. If it goes beyond 80%, it'll start starting up instances, right? Up till 10, max and min, just to keep a control over that. But if you are using partial, you can go beyond these uh, 1 to 10, right? So <clears throat> this is how I can real make it scale up and scale down in like seconds. Right, so even if I start getting requests at 701, uh, it's the call ticket booking happening on. Uh, it's it's about to start. Uh, the moment user starts hitting in, there will be a downtime of like five, ten seconds maybe uh, till I start up a new instance with my application loaded on it. Right. So this is one cool thing. So if if I use this with timing, if I'm al already aware of, I am pretty sure I can make a website which never ever kind of crashes because of overload or uh, more bandwidth issues and stuff like that. Okay, so now uh, moving on, this was the Joomla thing, my XYZ, I just created it, uh, again a CMS solution. So you get all these things for free, you don't have to pay anything here, right? Just for, especially in a free tier, there are some, some things like Max, you can uh, host up to 10 websites and stuff, but, uh, and also it's running on a shared tier, uh, share, shared virtual machines, but apart from that, it's pretty cool, pretty cool to play around with. Good for having a personal blog on, unless you are, your blog is getting something like 1000 hits a day, uh, you might want to move that from free tier to a basic tier. Okay, now um, probably I'll call up Ujwal. So I had some stuff regarding IoT as, as well. So it's, it's a very simple thing. So how many of you interested in IoT? Internet of Things? Okay, uh, and here's a nice offering from Microsoft which is known as Events Hub. So Events Hub is basically an ingestion engine. Uh, in an IoT scenario, you will have millions of devices, 10 millions of devices, all of them talking back and forth every second. Which means that you need a engine which can collect like 10 million or 50 million and data points per second, right? And uh, 
you don't want to run a relational database query you know on a relational database to figure out real time values like if you want to run uh, real time values of how many people here are uh, are sitting inside this room are wearing black right so this is something which i can figure out because you all are in the room but how many people who are crossing this door and have worn black color right this is something which i need to go back in time and figure out at different instances how many people were inside and then run that query right it becomes little difficult uh, iot queries are like that uh, analytics are like that so here event sub is one cool thing of data ingestion onto the cloud uh, which is highly scalable and then the other thing is basically you need to make some value out of this right you only have data you need to make information out of it and you want to run queries which are very much like sql but uh, it can support this kind of a huge bulky data so we have stream analytics uh, another service which kind of analyzes based on your set conditions so if you want to set a condition like i have these many air conditions in my uh, you know in in a particular enterprise i have 100 buildings each building 10 floors each floors has like 25 cub cubicles 25 cub each cubicle has like two sensors one light sensor one uh, sensor for temperature and then all of these guys are talking every second to the cloud right so those kind of scenarios is not so easy to handle like if you want to set conditions based on my temperature goes less than 25 switch on my ac goes above 27 switch off my ac right so to set those conditions and analyze uh, what kind of lighting conditions should i have inside my room because it's sunny outside so i don't want much light at night i want more light right so i can do a drastic amount of cost savings here for big enterprises right so there are a lot of guys who are actually working on such solutions for enterprises because that's a huge huge market in the coming days and things like events hub and uh, this analytics engine uh, helps you stream insights lets you look into those data and uh, you can use um, you can analyze that you can set conditions based on that i want to do this or do that so that's that's the basic idea here so <clears throat> one cool stuff which i was running here is an, an small piece of code which basically uh, does nothing but it generates those random data and sends it to the event hub client right and this data basically contains temperature simulator so simulated temperatures inside each of my rooms which i just talked about different cubicles having those temp sensors and it's sending it to the back end so it's a huge amount of data actually which it keeps sending so if you look into uh, my payload uh it's sending a timestamp building id temperature celsius sensor id and room id these are like basic bare minimal data which i need to actually control stuff so it's it can it's sending this in a payload in json format and then i'm dumping this data onto events hub that's the ingestion of it so it's calling that event hub method over there and then event hub is already set up there so what i did is i quickly went to the storage and uh, the output of my stream analytics which i'm s like in stream analytics engine you get some basic features like average sum and so on so now what i'm doing is based on my per second uh, input i can set a condition like start time for my stream analytics i want to start because office working hours is nine o'clock so I, i'll set a preset condition so my event ingestion i mean my data ingestion is happening 24 hours but my analytics engine needs to work only for nine hours a day right so i can start at a particular time at 9 am and what this stream uh, analytics does is it starts looking into data only which has come after 9 am and then gives you based on if you want a sum or if you want an average all the temperature it will give you that so it will give you average temperature of the room <clears throat> based on a particular time zone so here is what is what i get 1.2 let me refresh this because So you see the size of this file has increased because it's been constantly dumping data. I just switched this on like 20 minutes back. And if you open this, uh, this is a blob explorer. Uh, I can see the whole JSON format, which I'm sending there. Now it's calculating average. So it's giving me a room, which room, which particular building this room is in. Uh, what's the average temperature over there and the timestamp when this guy 
uh, last send the data right so I have all this information of each building and I'm calculating the average temperature now I can set a condition saying when the temperature goes beyond 36 switch on my AC or switch off my AC right that's that's really like what you use things in IOT for but but to read to actually make some meaning out of the data is where you need such engine uh, analytics engine there Cool, so I think, uh, Ujwal, you. Uh, we started like a little late. If you want. Mm -hmm. Is, is, uh, you, so, Okay, it's it's a so see uh, ingestion. You want to do a media uh, over there, right? So yeah, so see media server is nothing but a streaming server and an encoding server. Yeah. Correct. See. Ha ha. Correct. Uh, I don't think it's a, a real right application of events hub there because you see uh, events hub has limits it cannot capture like a live stream or it cannot capture a size file size of like 1 GB or more than some given size right so it's meant for capturing small data but huge scale data per second kind of things for media content what I would suggest you just have a worker role like a process running which is uploading the pushing the media on media onto the storage okay and have a backend service running which is collecting the whenever there is a media coming in it just starts to encode it basically that's that's the trigger to the media services to encode it and to keep it ready for streaming right but your ingestion is like you know you can use the same thing whenever I'm creating a media or something from multiple devices I'm just dumping that media onto my cloud service as in cloud storage right that's all because media can be stored there, right? So now, do you want to do that for live stream or something? Live streaming is, is going gonna, is gonna to be a little different. So live streaming also is supported in media service. It's in preview currently. So you can, but live streaming, you know, right? You can't pause, play those things. It's just like a stream comes in, goes out to that player. You can do very much that with media service, live stream. But you will have to create that many number of streaming servers, like to stream. You can have multiple streaming endpoints on a single server. That's not an issue, but just that it's sharing that same bandwidth. But you can do that. Uh, so I, I know it's already time, so I'm not going to take. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so my name is Ujwal. I work uh, as a technical evangelist as well, and I lead games mostly on Windows platform, but not necessarily Windows. So we founded a uh, India Gamers community as well. I'll quickly show that account to you as uh, you know, if you if you guys have interest or if you uh, you have friends who are building games on any platform, Android, iOS, or Windows, you know, you can always uh, go ahead and join there. But but then. What I'm going to show today is uh, quickly, very, very briefly about uh, identity. So uh, I think Praveen already mentioned about it, uh, but and I have already created. So there's no slide as such. I'll just go ahead and um, I'll just go ahead and show you a very quick uh, use of Facebook login, how you can use it in your apps. And uh, in this case, I'm I've chosen a game. Uh, Basically, Unity is not uh, not at all a game. I just use a Unity UI to connect, and uh, so I'm sure like most of you or people use Google Play services, but Play services has a limitation of only two platforms, right? Android and iOS, and it doesn't connect to uh, any other platform as such, including Windows. However, if you go ahead and use uh, you know Azure mobile services, which we have covered earlier, uh, you can do that very very quickly. So I'm just going to quickly log in. Um, to my Facebook and show you uh, from where we can get the uh, IDN token. Um, so it's just a sec here. So uh, uh, sure, you can see this. So I have created one app. So basically, you need to create one app 
and 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 uh, the tokens we can get the access key we can get from here right for this particular user i have got this token id now in in azure media services uh, sorry in azure mobile services so let me show you i have created some you know i wanted to show you from scratch but i think just yes, lunch sorry so i'm going to quickly connect to one of these existing ones uh, here if you go to identity you can find there are multiple ways to connect to azure uh, using even google uh, you can also connect using facebook so uh, quickly i've copied the same id and uh, key from here so if you uh, if you go back you know you can find uh, sorry i don't need to do a new one so he, by the way when I mean, you click new you choose website in that case but i already have created one for the website so here we get the id and you can just say show you'll get the access id i've copied that and then the second thing i just mentioned was the key so all you need to do is provide this id and the key for a uh, like facebook kind of login and that's pretty much after that i i go ahead and connect to my media services the same to do table or same to do thing which uh, praveen used i'm going to use the same thing uh, but quickly want to mention here so we have something called bitrave by the way bitrave site was hacked some time i think day before yesterday or something but this is a absolutely free plugin which is available to you source code is available on github you can uh, connect to uh, either of these uh, so i have the platforms windows windows phone android ios for that matter and uh, so i'm going to go ahead and say data right so i have created three tables for that matter right uh, just want to show you with one of these tables so uh, go to dashboard what you need to do is get the url and the app id for this so if i want to uh, let's say create if i want to create a connection with one of these existing windows phone windows 8 i can choose the platform for that matter so i can choose for android i can choose for windows i get the same id and token so let's say i choose a platform um, to connect for now i wanted this id and password so uh, key so i'm just going to choose this okay um, since i'm going to use this in multiple locations i will copy in a notepad kind of in moment okay q all right so um uh, this demo i am going to connect with unity right um my ui uh, in the mono um uh, editor we have already copied the id and the password is something which i'm going to change so this is already on github i'll uh, we can i uh, will be blogging and sharing the link later on this and tweet about so probably you can download from the tweet link if you are interested um and then just need to save right and once you save this in unity also you get the same stuff already uh, downloaded and saved so pretty much here uh, i'm also going to since i'm going to put this on the site as well i'm going to copy the same url here right a good thing is about unity is it's cross platform so you can actually uh, target one any of these uh, platforms or whatever platform you're building and using you can do that so i'm going to just go ahead and save this scene and i'll i'll run this from unity itself i don't need to save as save scene i'm going to run this so you'll see id basically uh, where i have already pre populated connection to my azure account and uh, the table and i have already say so first thing i need to do is authenticate since i have provided my access token um it it connects to my azure uh, site and then you can see right now it's grayed out the other stuff as soon as as i'm validated as a user from facebook account i will be connected to uh, my table and and you can you would be able to see this highlighted wherein you can enter stuff you can uh, download stuff so 
in the meantime, I'll just go ahead and quickly show the data. So, this is my table. Uh, so, to do item is where I have stuff and this is going to connect from to there. Still not connected. Depends on the network speed again. Right. Uh, yeah, so speed is little less, but uh, some, some text I entered earlier, uh, which you can find from the same site. So, basically token access and then using the same Azure connectivity uh, ID, which I created here, which is the access token. I can create apps or games or uh, you know, I can connect to a new one or existing one, very, very simple by saying which platform I want to target. So, I can choose Android, I can say create a new Android app and then connect. Uh, in fact, I can, let's see if I, I already have installed, so I, I already have a to-do table as well. Um, if I say download, in the meantime, since this is taking a lot of time to connect, I'm just going to say so this is going to download this it will down, download basically a Java file which you can go ahead and install uh, onto your machine with the Java project and if you have Android uh, uh, ADT to or, or Android, uh, any of uh, Eclipse or any of the bundles which you use, you can just open that there and you can connect. So, it's very simple. Um, it's not just connecting there. So, in, in any case, so Azure, you know, we have covered a lot of stuff. One important thing which I want to talk about is that it's, for, for trying it out, it's absolutely free, okay. Uh, so, you can actually go ahead and try, it. let me show that, in fact, that would be a better thing to show. Uh, so, if you go to uh, simple, uh, Azure Azure Microsoft com right uh, you will find all the related information so it's absolutely free if you want to try it out for one month all you need to do is sign with any Microsoft account ID it could be even Gmail ID but you just have to sign as Microsoft account right and you, you can go and subscribe to it for example you know why I want to use it uh, so, you can say try it out. So, try for free is here by default. Um, you know, whatever we have done so far, a lot of blogs are already available. You can actually try it out. But this is free and you get about $200 credit. Now, all you want to do is if you continue, uh, either you can contact us, you know, we can provide you some more pass, maybe $100 pass to extend and try it out, or uh, you can just sign with a different ID and you will have a different subscription, but you can continue with that. So, um, not sure, it's still connecting and the other stuff is also downloading. If you have any questions, maybe I can take questions in between for from, uh, from anything from Azure related stuff, like, no, all right, thanks. This is going to take time, so it's fine. So, how many of you are looking forward to use Azure? Like, so so far you have, you know, got to so three hands. Uh, all right, so you're already using it. You guys are already using it. So the thing is, uh, it's absolutely free. So just give it a try at least. See if you, you know, it fits to your scenarios. And and if you need any assistance, we I just tweeted. I think we have connected. Uh, uh, use use the hashtag Dwightcon IN. So, if you are interested, like you can always reach out to us saying, you know, I am interested to use Azure and we will help you out. So, we'll, if you need more passes or something, we can we can provide it to you. There are multiple scenarios where you can use all from login authentication to uh, uh, websites, media services, data, 
uh, uh, blobs, CDN, so many things are there available, uh, core logic, you know, so there are so many things. All right, thanks a lot, you know, we'll see you later.